Цукерис Вячеслав Футорный. Thank you very much for the introduction. And first of all, I should say that I am very grateful uh, to the selection committee for this wonderful opportunity to present my research. And what I'm going to talk about, uh, it's a, a line of my research in the last 30 years, roughly speaking. And I was uh, privileged to share it with the following list of people whom I owe a great deal for their cooperation, for their patience, for their friendship. I learn a lot from them and I keep learning. So th th there are my ex-students, my current students, my colleagues from all over the world. Uh, so here's the outline, a brief outline of my talk. So I will start with the motivation. So, uh, I will always assume that the field is algebraically closed of characteristic zero. And uh, let's imagine that we have an associative K algebra. And we want to study simple modules. So if uh, uh, this algebra is finite dimensional, then of course there is a well-developed theory. But if U is infinite dimensional, that our tools are quite limited. And then we need to make certain assumptions. So one possibility is to consider those uh, U-modules, which are semi-simple as gamma modules for a certain su fixed subalgebra gamma. So this idea is behind of the classical theory of Harishandra modules for the Lie algebras. So the general uh, uh, case of two associative algebras, algebra and subalgebra, was initiated uh, uh, by Drost of Sienka and myself uh, around 1990. Uh, one can say something in this case, but again, not, not much. So we still need to make uh, restrictions. So let's uh, concentrate on the case when the subalgebra gamma is commutative. Then we consider the modules, uh, which we call Harishandra modules, for the pair U and gamma. So they are finitely generated modules which uh, decompose into a direct sum of gamma submodules uh, indexed by the maximal ideals of gamma. And each subspace labeled by a maximal ideal M consists of those elements annihilated by a certain power of the maximal ideal. Equivalently, one can speak about uh, labeling instead of maximal ideals by the characters of gamma when the maximal ideal being the kernel of this character. So I will use these two languages, uh, ideals and characters, equally. And then the question is, given a maximal ideal of this commutative subalgebra gamma, can we find a simple module in this category uh, such that the corresponding component labeled by this maximal ideal is not trivial? Uh, or equivalently, Given maximal ideal of gamma, is there a maximal left ideal of the big associative algebra containing that? So we will call this set of such ideals uh, the fiber of M and denote it as Fm. So you can think of this fiber as just a, a set of uh, isomorphism classes of simple U modules uh, that contain comp M's component in their decomposition as a gamma module. So what is the size of M? Is it trivial? Is it finite or infinite? So let's look at some examples. So the basic example comes from the commutative algebra. So if we have an integral extension of two commutative rings, then we have a natural induced map on the spec of these rings. And then we have a line over property. So for any prime ideal of A, we have a prime ideal of B containing that. And moreover, so this says that the fiber is not trivial. And moreover, if B is finite over A, so meaning finitely generated A module, then the fiber is finite. And the classical like, his example is a Hilbert Neuter example where B being the polynomial ring and A being the invariant polynomial subring for some finite 
uh, group G acting linearly on the polynomials. So the situation is very nice in the commutative case, but we're interested in the non-commutative situation. Uh, next example comes from the okunikov vershik work on the representations of the symmetric uh, group. So in this case, our associative algebra U is the group algebra of the symmetric group. And then we have a natural embedding of the group subalgebras. So for the symmetric group S1, S2, and so on. In each of them, we can choose the center. And combining the center, we form a commutative subalgebra gamma in U which is a maximal commutative subalgebra. And it is generated by the uses Murphy elements, which are the sums of these transpositions. And Okonkov and Vershik used the characters of gamma to, to, as an alternative approach to the classification and construction problem of, of the irreducible representations of the symmetric group. And one more natural example, when we have a reductively algebra G, and a Cartan subalgebra H inside. Then we have a pair of two associative algebras, which are the inverse enveloping algebras. And then for any character of gamma, which is just a weight lambda of H, the fiber is infinite. Right? So we see that sometimes fiber is finite, sometimes the fiber is infinite. So what are the conditions on the pair U and gamma that guarantee that the fiber behaves well? So it is the key point here is to uh, ask the right question, which sort of captures the essential part of the problem. And then we started to think, uh, what is common in the examples, uh, in the good examples, when the fibers behave nice, and then as a result, as we will see, the representation theories uh, are well behaved. And it turned out that all those, or most of those examples, have a common feature. They have, these algebras have a, a hidden skew group structure. And namely, they are related to the concept of orders in the ring theory. So this is just to briefly remind uh, what the order is. So we have an integral domain gamma and a field of fractions k, and some simple k algebra. So meaning that uh, w is k central. And then an order over gamma is a gamma subalgebra in W, such that if we extend the scalars to K, we get the whole W. And extra requirement that U is a projective gamma module. So that's a sort of a classical, one version of the classical order. We're interested in non-central orders. So the setup is similar, only now we don't require W to be K, simple, uh, K central. So K need not to commute with, uh, to be central in W. And then the gamma order is again a gamma subalgebra U, such that if we do multiply on the left and on the right by K, we get the whole W. So I'll just call it localization property. Because essentially it's equivalent uh, to the fact that if we localize with respect to um, gamma without zero multiplicative set on the left, on the right, we get everything. And again, uh, projectivity of U as a left and as a right gamma module. So we're interested in the particular version of the non-central non gamma order, which is the following. So gamma and K are the same as above, but W is the particular ring like that where the ingredients are. So L is just a finite Galois extension of K with the Galois group G. And M is a subgroup, or more generally can be a submonoid of the automorphism group of L. And G acts on M by conjugation, and the intersection is trivial of G and M. Then we can naturally form the skew group ring LM and we have an action, induced action of G on this Q group ring. So we can uh, speak of on invariance under this section, and W is this invariant subring. 
So these are our setup. And then the uh, o gamma orders that we are interested in are, we call them Galois orders, so they were introduced in our work with Ovsienka in 2010. They are just finitely generated over gamma non-central orders in this invariant skew group subring. Sometimes we need a weaker condition, and uh, when we ignore the projectivity, so we just use a localization property without requirement of projectivity of U, and then in this case we call uh, this ring a Galois gamma ring. In fact, the, the concept can be generalized uh, extending or replacing the projectivity condition by this more general uh, technical condition. We don't know yet whether they are equivalent. Projectivity implies this condition. All examples of the Galois orders that we know, uh, they, are, they will be projective. In fact, they are free or conjecturally free uh, over gamma. So it is very likely that uh, this is equivalent, but uh, it's an open problem. So I will just assume the projectivity for simplicity. The uh, basic examples of Galois orders are the following. So this is the commutative situation when U lives in, in between gamma and K. Then if extension U gamma is integral, so we have a Galois order. So this is sort of a trivial example. The W ring itself is a Galois order if and only if the integral closure of gamma in L is L itself. So this was shown quite recently by Hartwig. And another source, uh, uh, and this subalgebra of W provides, uh, is a source of a number of examples of Galois orders. So what it says here that we, ca we consider those elements of W which preserve gamma, subalgebra gamma. When there is a natural action of W on uh, subalgebra gamma, and if the image is in gamma, then this is our subring w, w gamma, and then any Galois subring. So without uh, requirement of projectivity will be a Galois order. Again, so in fact, it gives some examples, not very enlightening. So we will go now to more interesting examples. So the classical while algebras, the differential operators on n-dimensional uh, affine space, so a unital associative algebra with two n generators with natural relations between uh, axis and partial derivatives. Then if we can consider uh, this polynomial subalgebra in variables t, where t's are just products on deltas and axis, then a n is a Galois gamma order. So it comes from the fact that if we localize a n with respect to gamma, the result will be isomorphic to the skew group ring uh, of the rational field with the free abelian uh, group of rank n. Similarly, the while algebra case is generalized to generalized while algebras uh, due to Bavula and Van Ostein. Uh, almost always, well, we need to have some restrictions, but essentially uh, all of them are uh, Galois orders over certain polynomial sub-algebras. And examples uh, of this kind are witten voronovich algebras, quantum Heisenberg algebra, and others. So there is a long list of these basic algebras which are Galois orders. So some recent results show that the list can be extended to the invariant subrings. So AN is still a while algebra, and G is one of the unitary reflection groups uh, of Shepard Todd when the parameter P is 1, or one of the alternating groups AN. Then the invariant subring of the while algebra is a Galois order of the corresponding invariant polynomials. And again, if now for all P's, this is the same question we ask in the quantum case. So for the quantum affine space, this also will be a Galois order of a polynomial algebra. And it can be extended even to a quantum torus. So these are our recent results with Jean Schwartz. 
uh, Galois orders have a very interesting uh, structure. Uh, I will only indicate these two properties, uh, which have the, probably the most uh, influence on the representation theory uh, of Galois orders. So first is uh, that if we have a Galois order, then necessarily our, this commutative subalgebra gamma will be what is called Harishandra subalgebra, which means that for every element u of u, this gamma bimodule will be finitely generated on each side as a left and as a right gamma module. It turned out that this property, which looks quite technical from the first sight, is extremely important uh, for the representation theory of Galois orders. And second one relates uh, the fact to be a Galois order with the maximality of this commutative subalgebra gamma. Uh, so if u is, an, uh, is a Galois ring, so we don't require to be ordered at the moment, and gamma is normal Harishandra subalgebra, then u will be a Galois order if and only if gamma is maximal commutative. So it turns out that uh, so Galois orders have a very nice representation theory, as we will see uh, further on. And it's based on the f particularly in the fact that gamma has to be maximal commutative in this case. Now, here's our main example that we're interested in. So this is the case of GLN. And algebra U will be the universal envelope in algebra of GLN. And uh, so we have a natural embedding of, of uh, matrices one by one, in two by two, and so on. And you can consider any embedding you like. You can start from upper corner and go down, or you can start from the uh, right uh, low corner, or you can start from the middle. It doesn't matter. It works for any chain of uh, GLN embeddings or GLK embeddings, and then here are the corresponding enveloping algebras. Then in each of them, we choose the center, and we generate a subalgebra. So this commutative subalgebra is called the gelfand settlin subalgebra. And it turns out that U is a Galois order over gamma with respect to the following ingredients. The field L will be just a rational field in n times n plus 1 over 2 variables. The Galois group G will be a product of symmetric groups, S1, Sn. Each of them acts on the uh, right set of variables. And the group M is a free abelian group of rank n, n minus 1 over 2. So with this data, the algebra U is a Galois order over the gelfand settlin subalgebra for GLM. And this was extended. Uh, for all finite algebras of type A. Yeah, it works in a similar manner. Of course, ingredients change, but it works for all finite W algebras of type A. Further examples include uh, the class of orthogonal gelfand settlin algebras. They were introduced by Mazarchuk, and parabolic finite W algebras of type A and finally, that's the most recent added class of rational Galois orders. Uh, I will come back to this class uh, a bit later. So we have a quite extensive list of examples of Galois orders. And now representation theory. So suppose U is a Galois order, then it turns out that the fiber of any maximal ideal is always non-empty. And it is finite under the certain condition that the stabilizer of this maximal ideal uh, in a group M is finite. So it says that, uh, well, modulo this uh, condition on the stabilizer, so the fibers are always non-empty and finite. So it sort of gives us the first approximation to the classification of simple uh, modules in the uh, corresponding Harish-Chandra category for the pair U and gamma. Moreover, we have a, a bound for the number of isomorphism classes of such simple modules 
that belong to this fiber. So for GLN, so the formula in general is quite complicated, but for GLN, it uh, amounts to the following number. Yeah, so the size of the fiber is bounded by this uh, product of the factorials. So it's quite big if n is large. Uh, there is no proof yet that this is an exact bound. We know this for, for GL2 this is trivial, for GL3 this is known. And, uh, but we strongly believe that uh, it, this is an exact bound and we are moving in the direction uh, of the proof. So now I will concentrate on the main application of the theory for, for uh, GLN. And the GLN case, the corresponding Harishandra modules for the pair UGLN and uh, gelfand settlin subalgebra are called gelfand settlin modules. So I'm just recalling the definition here. And the problem we're interested in, can we uh, classify simple gelfand settlin modules in this case? So the whole theory of gelfand settlin uh, the whole gelfand settlin theory goes back at least to 1950s. And I, I want to use this opportunity to give tribute to two great founders of the theory, Israel Moiseevich Gelfand and Mikhail Lvovich Zetlin. So the gelfand settlin theory during the 70 years of development found enormous applications uh, in, in, everywhere. Yeah, first of all, uh, of course, it's relevant and significant for the representation theory of classical Lie algebras, uh, Youngians, W algebras. So I just listed some names that contributed, but the list is uh, very far from being exhaustive. Representations of quantum groups, uh, the geometry of gelfand settlin polytopes, vertex algebras, gelfand settlin integrable systems, hypergeometric functions on Lie groups, and so on and so forth. The main uh, combinatorial uh, tool in the gelfand settlin theory is uh, gelfand settlin tableau, or sometimes called diagram, sometimes an array. So this is a triangular array of uh, n times n plus 1 over 2 complex entries. And the tableau is called standard if uh, the entries satisfy this relation, so the difference between the neighboring rows, between, so this arrow go, it means going down, so it's a first condition, and the second one is going up, that's an arrow going up. So here is uh, not strict, and here is strict. And uh, the tab tableau is called generic if we don't have entries in the same row anywhere with uh, integral difference. And delta ki denotes the Kronecker tableau, which has one, only one entry on zero, one on case row and i's place, and healthy where is zero. So this is our key uh, combinatorial object. And the classical theorem of gelfand settlin from 1950 gives a basis for finite dimensional simple GLN modules. So starting from the highest weight lambda, which is just an tuple of complex numbers with uh, non-negative non integer differences of neighbors, we take a span of uh, the tableaus, complex span of the tableaus, whose entries look like that, and they are still standard in the sense above. Then th this uh, space has a structure of a GLN module, and the action of the generators of GLN given by these formulas. These coefficients E plus and E minus are certain rational functions evaluated in the entries of the tableau. And here we have a tableau shifted by the Kronecker delta when we add one or minus one in the corresponding places. And the diagonal elements act by mul multiplication by certain symmetric polynomials, or the values of symmetric polynomials. So these are classical formulas of gelfand settlin uh, 
I should mention the relation between the tableau and the characters of the Gelfand Settling subalgebras. So the correspondence is the following. So tableau modulo, the action of the, our Galois group, where S1 acts on the first, the bottom line, S2 acts on the second uh, from, uh, from below, and so on. So the action, this is the action of the symmetric group on tableau, and the class corresponds to a fixed character of the Gelfand Settling subalgebra. So, construction of Gelfand Settling modules is uh, known in the following cases. So, first of all, for the standard tableau, that's a classical result. For the generic tableau, so this was done in 1992. And multiplicities, meaning the dimensions of those components labeled by the corresponding maximal ideals, it's, it's one in all these cases. And for generic case, it's easy to gen just generalize the theorem of Gelfand Settling. Consider a span of all tableaus shifted by all possible integers. And that uh, has a structure of a GLN module with the formulas the same as in the uh, classical theorem. Well, it took a while to consider uh, to obtain uh, some middle cases. So we have standard and generic but there is a lot of singular cases in between. So only in 2016-17, uh, that's where the breakthrough happened. So it was like a gust wind. You know, for many, many years, nothing happening, and then suddenly there is a breakthrough. And then there is a hole to another dimension, and the results are just coming in a, in a huge uh, flow. So one singular case is done, and uh, very recently the arbitrary singular tableau. So which means for any tableau, so you just put any numbers you want in this tableau, there is a construction of a certain module, a Gelfand Settling module, which uh, has a component corresponding to the corresponding character, uh, character uh, Gelfand Settling subalgebra that corresponds to this tableau. The construction is uh, highly non-trivial, starting from one singular case. The action of the generators are not the classical ones, so the formulas are completely different. And there is also a class of, a uh, particular class of, of rational modules that go back to the work of Gelfand and Greif, so I will um, talk about them a bit later. So, after we constructed the module with a given tableau, do we know that we obtain all simple modules as a quotient of this universal module? The answer is yes in the generic and one singular case. So, all such modules appear as a subquotients, which is uh, the essence of the theorem in the one singular case. And it is an open conjecture in general. Again, there is a, it's, uh, we strongly believe that this is the case, but uh, uh, it's quite, uh, quite involved, uh, the technique and the proof of this statement. So it is still open. Uh, and a couple of remarks that I want to say. So first of all, we know when uh, the module, this uh, universal module corresponding to uh, one single tableau is simple. So here is the condition, the sufficient condition for simplicity. It turned out that the singular Gelfand Settling modules, the co those corresponding to a singular tableau, have a strong connection with Schubert polynomials. So the, one can uh, provide a basis of this module given by the BGG differential operators, which are related to Schubert polynomials. And the action of a subalgebra gamma is described via postnikov stanley polynomials. So this is a very recent result, which again I will mention in a more general context uh, below. Uh, and it was recently obtained in our work with Grancharov, Ramirez, and Zadunaisky. A few words about relation modules. As I promised, they originated in the work of uh, Gelfand and Graev. And the idea was that, so we have a basis for finite dimensional modules. Uh, let's ask a question. Can we 
extend this construction to some infinite dimensional simple modules in a way that the action of generators is again the, the same as in the classical theorem, that the formulas are the same. They provided a class of such modules. Uh, this was later improved by uh, Lemire and Patera. And finally, uh, we completed the theory and provided, so the relation modules refers to the largest possible class of Gelfand-Settlin modules where the action can be given by the classical formulas. Anything beyond that requires a modification, like in a one singular case and all other singular cases. So the setup is the following. Just look at the set of ordered pairs ij and double it in such a way that the first indices are distinct uh, by at most one. Then if we have, we will uh, do the graphic interpretation for such pairs. So for this pair, we go the arrow going down, and for this pair, the arrow will go up. So suppose we have, uh, so in this uh, set R of such uh, double pairs, take any subset. We will call it a set of relations. And if we have a, some uh, tableau TV, we will call it a C realization if the entries satisfy all relations in C, meaning that we have the not strict inequality between the entries if we have an arrow going down between the indices, and we have a strict relation if we have arrow going up. So this sort of resembles what we had in the uh, standard tableau right at the beginning. So, and the standard tableau corresponds, uh, the tableau will be standard if it's a realization of the following set S. It's right here. It says that in the corresponding tableau, you have arrows everywhere. It's like zigzags between all possible lines. Now let's look at the set of all relations C satisfying the following condition. If we look at the two neighbors that participate in this relation in the same row, then they must form either rhombus or these two things, two arrows with S and less than T. So there is a gap in between. So this is the condition on the relation C. Now let's, uh, for any C, we can look at the old tableaus uh, shifted by the integer entries, which satisfy the same set of relations. So now we are mimicking the gelfand settlin construction. And take a complex uh, space spent by this tableau. And here's the main result. Uh, so the resulting space will have a, a structure of a GLN module with a standard action of generators, like in the gelfand settlin uh, theorem. So we call such uh, module a tableau gelfand settlin module. And this will be if and only if C is a union of those sets with a rhombus restriction. Such relations are called admissible. So this is a criteria when the module can be constructed using the classical formulas. Moreover, the action of gamma of the gelfand settlin subalgebra is diagonalizable. The multiplicities of all spaces uh, the spaces Vm uh, will be bounded by 1. The criteria of simplicity of this model is quite simple. So it will be simple if and only if C is a maximal set of relations satisfied by TV, by this tableau. The multiplicity I just said. And then the question is, how can we construct, how can we describe all uh, admissible relations? Right? So each of them gives a rise to infinitely many simple gelfand settlin modules. Just pick a tableau satisfied uh, such that this is the maximal set of relations satisfied by this tableau, and you have a simple module. But can we describe all of them? Well, there is no description, complete description of all such admissible sets, but there is a, an algorithm which allows, given an admissible set of relations, produce a new one and then if you know that one is admissible, for example, the standard one, there is a way 
of deleting arrows uh, from this uh, zigzag diagram and obtaining a new admissible relations, and hence new simple modules. So this is the way to produce uh, uh, a huge family of new simple modules for GLM, where uh, the gelfand settlin modules and the action of the generators is the same as the classical one. The gelfand Graev uh, modules is a proper subclass. Uh, they believed that they had them all, but in fact not. So further developments. So I mentioned already uh, rational Galois orders, which include in particular W algebras, Youngians, and so on and so forth. So in the last couple of years, there was a, a, a huge activity in this direction. So the rational Galois orders were introduced by Hartwig, and the basics were set up. And then uh, early Mazarchuk and Vishnyakova started representation theory of these algebras, uh, or a particular class uh, of these algebras. And then, uh, as I already mentioned, in a recent work with Granchara, Ramirez, and Zadunaisky, we developed the uh, theory of gelfand settlin modules for all rational uh, Galois orders. In particular, again, as I already mentioned, uh, we construct in the GLN case, but this works uh, in the general case for all W algebras and Youngians in particular uh, of type A. Uh, we have a basis consisting of Schubert polynomials with a very interesting combinatorial action of the gelfand settlin subalgebra, uh, which can be extended to the action of the whole algebra. Uh, in particular, as a consequence, uh, we have uh, sufficient condition for the simplicity of constructed universal modules. So as a result of this work, we have, uh, a, again, a large number of uh, uh, new simple modules for all, w, uh, for all rational Galois orders, in particular for W algebras of type A. Uh, another direction. Uh, is a sort of a geometric construction of gelfand settlin modules, which was developed. Uh, there is a correlation between the gelfand settlin theory and the uh, flag manifolds. And uh, so this is sort of uh, was initiated by Krishka and Somberg, and there is this ongoing, ongoing work here. Uh, so this was sort of a type A uh, above. Uh, there is a similar theory, gelfand settlin theory, developed for orthogonal Lie algebras. Uh, very far from being on the same level as in the A type. But there is an ongoing research uh, here and the attempts to construct the Galois orders uh, related to orthogonal Lie algebras. And uh, one more line of uh, gelfand settlin theory that I wanted to mention is a partial gelfand settlin modules. So the gelfand settlin subalgebra is a maximal commutative subalgebra, right? And the gelfand settlin modules, we can picture just a module where this maximal commutative subalgebra has a torsion. What if it only part of this gamma has a torsion. Yeah, so the gamma is a polynomial ring in n times n plus 1 over 2 variables. What if we remove one variable and we just allow torsion for the rest? So if this happens, such uh, uh, modules are called partial gelfand settlin modules. Their importance uh, lies in the fact that... Uh, uh, so we can ask, I mean, why do we need to study, as, as Olivier asked in, the, uh, in his talk, why, why do you care about gelfand settlin modules aside of the fact that they are beautiful and so on and so forth? It's because uh, the ultimate goal is to understand simple modules for the, let's say, uh, GLM. Of course, that's impossible. It's a wild problem. 
Okay, so we want to know weight modules with respect to a fixed Cartan-Sub algebra. Unless you put restrictions on the dimension of weight spaces, again, it's, it's a very hard problem. So the gelfand settlin modules, the, this category, is the largest category where one can uh, get hand on simple modules. It contains all uh, known cases, the uh, weight modules with finite dimensional spaces, category O, and so on and so forth. So only Whittaker modules are left aside. So, and the partial gelfand settlin modules, that's an ex sort of extension of the gelfand settlin uh, category, uh, which allows to, to, to move on and to look beyond of the gelfand settling category. So I wrote for the sake of those who will look on the YouTube, then they don't need to search. So here's a list of all the papers that contain the results I mentioned. And thank you very much. So it's a very natural and very good question. So even if you look, think of SL2, gelfand settling modules for SL2, they are just weight modules. There is nothing else, because the gelfand settling subalgebra is small. Uh, it's just generated by two, two elements. Uh, but th these modules allow infinite self-extensions. So unless you kill this, uh, restrict this infinity, you don't have enough projectives. So it, it does not have, without any extra conditions, does not have uh, properties uh, as nice as category O or some gen parabolic categories O. Nevertheless, uh, so, and the gelfand setting category is too large. For example, it's not a tensor category. But there are some nice subcategories which are larger than the category O where many things can be done. Uh, so that's uh, it's an open problem, uh, and, uh, but, uh, but surely there are subcategories uh, where with the nice homological properties. Any more questions, comments? If not, let's send this.